You know what the biggest problem is with you fitness fanatics out there? You don't let your body recover. You overtrain all the time so nothing happens. You stay in the same place. You're spinning your tires in the dirt. That's why we did this episode. This episode is all about the reasons why you're not recovering and seeing results. Great podcast, but I also have a giveaway for you right now. So here's the giveaway. The MAPS Prime Bundle, which will help you recover by working on mobility, improving connectivity, getting better ranges of motion, facilitating recovery through movement. It's great. The bundle includes MAPS Prime, MAPS Prime Pro. You will get that for free, but you got to do this and you have to win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. If we pick your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to the MAPS Prime Bundle. Also, we're running a 50% off sale right now. Two programs, MAPS Hit, that's high intensity interval training, and MAPS Split, that's a bodybuilder style split routine. Both 50% off. Go sign up at mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code DEC50 for 50% off. All right, here comes the show. We get a chance to talk to Cassie once a week and she handles a lot of the customer service on the back end. And I always love her suggestions on the single topic episodes because she can always go, hey, this is I'm getting a lot of questions uh, around this specific topic. And I'm not sure if we've done an organized episode around this, um, but I do remember getting a lot of questions. And that is when people aren't recovering, like, right, like they-, they Yeah, like what's going on? Like they're sore a lot or, you know, they feel like I'm just constantly sore yeah, and I've been- beat up. And I've been training for a while now and they feel like they're doing mm -hmm. the right things, but- don't quite understand why their body isn't fully recovering. And, you know, what are some of the things that you guys, and this is her asking us, like, what do you guys ask them or what do you what do you look at first to help this person figure out why they're not recovering? I love talking about this because this is one of those uh, um, crucial pieces to whatever your pursuit is that I think a lot of people just glaze over it and don't realize how insanely important it is. This is where all the magical things happen that you're looking to 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 achieve with uh, either gaining muscle or you know anything kind of performance related. Yeah, and, and let's. I mean, truth be told, aside from nutrition, this is probably one of the hardest things uh, to figure out. I'd say this is probably the one that I've struggled with the most for as long as I've been training. Is that that line between you know the right amount of training and and you know not recovering or overtraining. By the way, one of the reasons why this is so challenging for a lot of people is because as your lifestyle changes, as your life changes, we're going to go It's a moving target. This. Right. Yeah. That's the challenge. The challenge is this workout's always been right. okay for me, and now all of a sudden I can't recover yeah. from it. Something What's going changed. on? So that's one of the first things I actually say to someone who, who says this to me is, I first I want them to know that, listen, this is part of the process is figuring this piece out. And even with me, I've been doing this for 20 plus years. I still run into this today because lifestyle changes, diet changes, programming yeah, changes. You get older. Yeah, there's a lot of things that are are changing, and so it's it's constantly a, a, a moving target. And instead of uh, getting frustrated uh, from it or allowing it to 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 uh, you know influence you quitting, just look at it as as a signal that okay, there's something there's something that I'm I'm not doing here that I can improve upon and, and address it that way. Yeah, so I think we should open with some just easy signs uh, or some clear signs that you're probably not recovering fully. Um, the first one would be nagging inflammation. Mm. So this is when you feel inflammation, typically at the insertion or origins of muscle, like or at the joints. Like, oh, why is my elbow kind of bothering me all the time? Or, man, my, my knee feels a little stiff or sore or my shoulder or here at my in the armpit part of my pec it feels a little sore for me this is this is a really clear sign is i'll feel these kind of inf inflamed areas Twinges twi almost. yeah and they're just nagging you know yeah. i guess that's the best way to describe it, right they're nagging mm -hmm. uh, inflammatory issues the next one that's really obvious is for me at least is bad sleep like whatever your normal sleeping patterns are if mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're waking up throughout the night or restless uh, or not able to, or you wake up super exhausted, like you didn't sleep at all, 
that can often be a sign that you you're not recovering properly. Yeah, I noticed that one a lot when the restless nights and and partially because of how I'm training, but also too the amount of stress I'm carrying uh, and not properly releasing and dealing with uh, throughout the day that I then it carries into my sleep, which then if you don't get quality sleep, you're not fully recovering. It sort of perpetually just keeps this, uh, you, you know, you in the same state where you're fighting uh, this this constantly. I, you know, I think that uh, how sore you are is a signal too. Like being sore is is part of the process. Like you're, it's inevitable if you do movements and things you've never done before, and mm -hmm. and you you train with any sort of intensity at all, that there's likelihood going to be some soreness. But I remember being a young kid and actually chasing this, like looking for to be as crippled as possible, thinking that the harder I go or the more sore I am, the, the harder better. it is for yeah. me to yeah to move, the better it is when it's the complete opposite. Like I want to I want to feel that I did the workout. I want to know I want to be reminded that, like, oh, yeah, I trained that yesterday. I can feel that. But I don't want to feel like it limits my movement and my day-to-day -day type stuff. And if so, if it's limiting the way I walk, if it's limiting the way I squat or sit down and I'm you, oh, to, yeah, to, too, too much, move, too much. Yeah. And and that is uh, a lot of times the, the first sign that will lead to this kind of chronic soreness or lack of recovery. Yeah. And then there's lack of energy, you know, where you just feel like you, you need more caffeine throughout the day. You're just kind of fatigued. You're dragging, you're lacking mm -hmm. the same drive. That often means that your body is, uh, you know, it's moving resources to healing. And that's a lot of this is, is a lot of that is, is, is what we're talking about is your body is diverting resources to healing mm -hmm. and constantly trying to heal. By the way, adaptation is different than healing. Healing is literally the, the healing process. Adapting is going above and beyond that to you know become stronger or more resilient to the same stress uh, that you that caused the the damage in the first place well when all these things you know all these factors stack up to i feel this like brain fog a lot of times so i don't have the same type of sharpness yeah. and memory recall and i just feel like uh, throughout the day i'm just fighting this this notion of like uh, i just don't have that kind of clarity and and a uh, sharpness that i would normally have if i'm full of energy and fully recovered yeah and then another one is like intolerances to temperature all of a sudden you're either too hot or too cold um Hands get really cold and clammy. Feet get cold and clammy. This is a, a sign that your body's pumping out stress hormones, trying to keep you moving and keep. I was going to ask you, what is the actual mechanism that's happening that causes that? What is it? Because it's allocating resources other, and though it can't, it can't regulate temperature. It's, it as has well? to do with the catecholamine production, cortisol, stress hormone mm -hmm. release. Like when you get those stress hormones, like okay, so if, let's say you're you're in a room and then like a, a, a scary dog walks in, right? Your your fight or flight kicks in. You're going to get the cold, clammy hands. You're going to get the the cold sweat. You know, you're going to feel that because that hormone does that to the body, and it's as a, it's a side effect because what it's doing is trying to mobilize energy to get you to move. But uh, if this is happening all the time, that means that you're 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 off. Your stress hormones are higher. Your body's trying to keep you going. It's trying to keep you going while it's healing by by producing more of these stress you know compounds. Another one that I think is common when you're young, uh, that's a, a harder signal to pick up on, is just the uh, hard plateau. You know, so you're you're training hard and consistent, but you I mean I I remember this in my twenties. Uh, knowing that I've been training seven days a week and hitting everybody, but just being stuck in the same place forever. Mm -hmm. And because you're so young and resilient, you you don't realize that part of the reason why you're stuck in this plateau is you're not recovering properly. Yeah, you're like, I got to go harder. Right. Yeah. And you just keep upping it, upping up the intensity, thinking that you need more and more and more. And because you're so young and resilient, you don't realize that it's not, it's that your recovery process is what's hindering you from continuing to yeah. ad adapt and grow and change. Yeah. What used mm -hmm. to happen to me was I would plateau and then I just throw more at myself and more right. at myself. More and is better I, always. And right? then I'd start to go backwards. Yeah. yeah. And that's when I would have that wake up call. Like what? I just went down 15 pounds in my squat. Uh oh, maybe I'm overdoing it. You know, it would take me that long to kind of you know figure that out. Okay, so let's talk about some of the reasons why you're just not recovering. The first one is I think the most obvious, which is your workout programming is inappropriate for you. Now I think it's important to clarify that what inappropriate means for you is very individual. Okay, for you in this moment, in the context of your current life. Okay, yeah. inappropriate means you're doing in this particular sense. 
you're doing more than is necessary to get your body to progress. Actually, you're doing too much. You're doing the, you're going so hard or doing too much to the point where your body is not adapting. It's only worrying about healing. And remember, when it comes to exercise, the right dose is the going to get you there the fastest. More than the right dose will actually slow down your progress. Too much beyond that means you're not going to go anywhere at all. And and so workout programming often is just inappropriate for people. What does this look like? It's too intense. That's one, right? You're just mm -hmm. going too hard. Sometimes, and this is where those, uh, what do they call those weeks where they, uh, like, or the, where they scale down the intensity? Deload. Deload, Deload week. There you go. You know, they do studies on deload weeks, and they find with hard training athletes and lifters that they make the most gains during the deload weeks, well, during when they drop the intensity. trippy because you go on vacation, and you're so stressed out that you're not able to continue that type of routine that you've established, and you know, you've been so consistent, but then you know, you, you're off for a week, let's say, and then you come back, and you're like, oh my God, I feel so much stronger. And, and it trips you out because it... And it what, is a glaringly obvious thing at that point is like, well, maybe I could do a little bit less and see, you know, a better result. And so sometimes that's a good indication of like, maybe I might be uh, going too much, well, too we, hard. We have to remember that, that training um, is a stress. And if you are doing it like crazy, your body is just trying to defend itself from all these insults. Yeah. And, and if you just keep piling that on, like it doesn't, you don't allow it to adapt and get better. It's constantly trying to play defense because mm -hmm. you're throwing everything at it all the time. Yeah. And sometimes we just don't look at it like that. We think, oh, more is going to give me more results. And it's not true at all. There is definitely a sweet spot. And that sweet spot is different for it every moves. individual. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah moves. it moves for every individual. It's different. It's different at different periods of your life. It, it, de it determines day to day based off of rest and nutrition. There's so many factors that, that play a role in this that it's not simply just going and hammering your body and then I should see the results. I mean, I'm going to use it. I'm going to use an analogy. So, uh, and, and before I do, so we're talking about working out too hard. That means the intensity is too high. You're either going to failure, you're doing too many supersets, you're pushing your body harder than you need to, or you're working out too long. Mm -hmm. Workouts are lasting too long. Again, too this is volume. very individual or you're working out too often. That's another one. So here's the analogy, right? So it, let's say I wanted to develop a callus on my hands. Well, the way I stimulate a callus is I, Rough, I rub a rough object on my hand. And if I do it right, I'll cause a little bit of damage. Then what my body will do is heal the damage. And then it'll add extra layers of skin to build a yeah. callus. So Protective that next time, layers. exactly, that's the adaptation process, right? Yeah. The healing is the skin healing. The adaptation is callus. And that what that does is it sets me up so that next time I don't cause as much damage. So too hard would be rubbing my skin really hard, right? Too long would be just, I, I'm rubbing it way too long. Too often is I don't give my skin enough time in between rubbing it to cause it, to allow it to, to heal and to adapt. So there, and, and, and the, the condition of my skin and the condition of my body will, has a large role in determining what's too hard What's too long? What's too often? Mm -hmm. So this is what happens oftentimes with the training. Another thing is that you might just be doing the wrong kind of workout, just period, doing the wrong kind of workout. You know, yeah. I, I I had a client once. I'll never forget this woman who was a she was a an executive, very you know go attitude, and she trained with me three days a week, and then she did all this high intensity cardio. Couldn't figure out why she wasn't losing body fat. And her calories were, were being cut. And it was just, just a strange thing. And this was earlier, early-ish in my career. And I remember saying, let's trade out two of those hard cardio sessions for a relaxing type of yoga. And she's like, but I'm burning way less calories. So should I cut my calories? I said, no, let's see what happens. Let's just replace them with the yoga, and which is way less intensity. You're not burning as many calories. You're not damaging your body as much. And let's see what happens. And at first, she tripped out because she didn't gain weight. So she's like, this is weird. I'm not yeah. even gaining body fat. I'm not burning as many calories. And then something funny happened. Her body started to progress and adapt because that was the right kind of workout to add to her body at that moment. Right. And also, too, when it comes to programming, so what you do the in-between days is also you know a factor where uh, way back in the day, I used to think it, you'd train as hard as possible and then you'd rest as hard as possible. So yeah. meaning you'd lay down, you would do as minimal movement as possible, and we would just sort of ride it out until uh, I was fully recovered. And then I would go back and, and hammer myself just as hard when, in fact, you know, one of the most effective ways to fully recover is to add light movement into 
to add a bit of activity and active recovery. And so, you know, once I started kind of incorporating in uh, real light movement, stimulate the muscles, get the, the blood pumping, because in a sense, the blood is actually, you know, one of those mechanisms that helps you to, to recover fully if you get good circulation. It does, and it doesn't cause more damage. It, it facilitates recovery. I, I must have experienced this a million times before I figured it out where I'd work out my legs real hard, yeah. and then my buddies would be like, let's go ride our mountain bikes. I'm like, damn it, I'm not going to recover because I'm going to go ride mountain bikes, but I really want to do it. So then I'll go, and I'd come back and be like, my legs are way less sore. And then the next day, I'm like, wow, it's gone. And I didn't piece it together until like, it happened 15 times in a row, and I was like, maybe the movement is making me recover faster. I used to think what you thought. I would go home, I'd put my legs up, and be like, oh, yeah. time was, to grow. <laughs> just totally. talking about this reminds me of, so I, at uh, one point, um, I lived across the street from the gym when I lived with my grandmother when I first moved to the Bay Area, and I was I was in this place like mm. where uh, I believe that it was all about how hard you train and then how much you could rest, and to the point where I was like competitive with like how much could I just <laughs> yeah. I, would, I would go train the shit out of him. I mean like crippling, barely walk out of the gym for two hours, go to across the street to my my grandma's house, lay in the bed and just like literally like look at the time like okay I got I got on the bed by one cool yeah, and just, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. lay there all day like thinking that like. All this muscle right was, your bed. Yeah, it's yeah. building. Yeah, calling my grandma. Grandma, could you bring me some chicken and rice? Like, <laughs> <laughs> literally, I did that for months thinking that this was going to build the yeah. most amount of Active muscle. Active recovery is like stretching, light movement, trigger sessions like you'll find in MAPS Anabolic. Mobility. Yeah. Mobility is phenomenal for active recovery. So you're you're sore, so the following day you're working on mobility and you're moving your body through full ranges of motion and you're not causing more damage. You're literally speeding up the recovery process. And in fact, it's the it's the opposite of what we used to think. Like if you worked out and then didn't move at all, in fact, if you tested this on yourself, work out real hard and then stay bedridden for a week and then go back to work well, out, you'll be weaker. Well, be weaker. And, and anybody who's had surgery knows this, right? Because the first thing that they're trying to make sure that they establish is that you get up and, yes. you, and you move and you get that movement established so that way, you know, the body like gets that signal like, hey, we need to recover. We need to get back, uh, you know, to accomplish like what we used to be able to do. And so in order to do that, you got to really kind of work through that to get to that place. Well, yeah. it's, it's obvious when you understand what's going on, right? You, you when you move and walk around, you're you're moving blood and oxygen and nutrients. Mm -hmm through the muscles. So it's like, what do you think is going to speed up recovery and build more muscle would be sitting there and slowing down how much blood, oxygen and it's nutrients not as effective or right? pumping a bunch of blood and nutrients through there. You, it just makes total sense when you understand what, what the recovery process looks like that. Oh, I don't want to completely be sedentary. Plus That's not ideal. You're sending a weird yeah. signal to your body by not moving afterwards. Cause your body's like, uh Oh, we're a lot of stress. Got to repair, got to build. And then, oh, wait a minute, we don't need these muscles. They're not really moving much anymore. So it's this weird counter signal that actually causes recovery to take uh, much longer. The next one, this one's a big one, and I didn't figure this out until I was older, which is sleep quality. Poor sleep quality will crush your ability to recover. And I don't care who you are. I don't even care if you're on tons of anabolic steroids or whatever. I don't care how great your genetics are. If you have poor sleep... You can forget, not only can you forget about recovering from your workouts, you can forget about your brain getting rid of the, the the waste products and stuff that it needs to for you to function the next day to the point where lack of sleep quality accelerates or causes dementia, Alzheimer's, yeah. lots of health issues to the point, again, they've done studies where they've gone had people go sleep deprived. They go I think crazy. Within three days, I think the, the rate of insanity is like 50% or something like that. So really crazy. So this is a big deal. And it's not just, I didn't sleep for eight hours. It's, did you sleep good for eight hours? Or were you up kind of throughout the night? Were well, you restless? This is where you actually get a chance to, to build your body back and, and fully recover and balance out your hormones and, and your body to sort of catch up with all the stimulus and all the insults that you've uh, you you know, like put put upon it uh, throughout the day. Now, the most important part I think of this is actually uh, addressing how you get better at this versus talking about it. Because of course, because I don't know if you got. I mean, I remember hearing and reading the importance of yeah. sleep. So then you just go to bed. Yeah, and like, okay. right. So I kind of always knew that. Like it was just kind of eh, whatever. And I know that I I dismissed it and said, oh, I'll I'll sleep when I'm dead and sleep's overrated. Like I used to say those things, but it wasn't like I did. I wasn't reading anything that said we you sleep wasn't important like i think i feel like a lot of people that are listening right now know that 
I think the most important message is, so what does that look like if I really want to improve it? That was something that didn't come full circle to, for me later on. Like, mm -hmm. oh, and I th and the best thing that someone ever said to me, and I don't remember where the first time I heard it was like, you know, it's it's so interesting how we all have these crazy rituals around getting up and starting our day. You know, everything from brushing your teeth to showering mm -hmm. to, you know, cup of coffee, cup of coffee yeah. to reading a newspaper to, you know, whatever. It's like we have these these systems that we put in place and your alarm sets every single day. Most people have an alarm that's set at the same time every day. They consistently do it. But bed is nighttime is so different. Oh, it depends on if I'm watching a Netflix show. I might go to bed at midnight. I might go to bed at 10 o'clock. I might go to bed sometimes at 930 mm -hmm. if I'm really tired and exhausted and I feel I have to. Or, you know, no one really puts a lot of energy and focus around preparing themselves for sleep. And I think learning how to do that will improve the sleep quality versus like you were saying, Justin's like, what do I do? Just lay there and like try and sleep harder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause that's, sleep. that's the way I hear it. You know, that's the way I hear it. The first, when I thought about it before, just like, what am I going to do? Try and sleep better. That just sounds weird. No, I think preparing is uh, that's the, the best first step, right? Have a schedule. I go to bed at, I, you know, I want to be in bed by 10. So at 9 PM, I'm getting ready to go to bed. What does that look like? I'm going to dim the lights, wear blue light blocking glasses. I'm not going to eat anything. I'm not going to have any stimulants after, you know, maybe 3 p.m. And I'm preparing for bed. And then when it's time to go into bed, my brain and my body are ready to go to sleep. Well, the blue light gl blocking glasses are great, but also like the the closer you can get to that first light to when the sun goes down, you know, obviously that's like sort of your 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 great window, so you can kind of match that circadian rhythm uh, kind of period. Because I I noticed too, like if I get more sunlight during the day, it's a lot easier yes. for me to get deeper sleep. Yes, that's a big uh, one, which Huge does difference. play a factor for me personally, and also too not eating too late, which then now my I have digestive things that interrupt that uh, real deep sleep that I could Yeah, achieve. well, your organs have circadian rhythm too. So sun, light and sun, uh, you know, they help set your circadian rhythm, but so do your organs, including your stomach. So when you eat food really late, <clears throat> that sends a signal to your brain that says, All right, it's time to be awake. So you probably don't want to eat a couple hours uh, before bed. The well, next one is that your stress bucket might already be full or it's overflowing when you add your workout. What does that mean? So your body, think of your body having a stress bucket and all stress gets thrown into this bucket. So workout, is that a stress? Yes, it is. Uh, what about um, argument with my spouse? That's a stress. Uh, tr you know, I yelled at the guy in traffic. That's a stress. Work is real hard right now. Right. That's a stress. Lack of sleep. That's a stress. So if you're throw, if you know, Traffic. if you know in your life right now that you have a lot of stress going on, what you probably don't want to do is throw a very stressful workout on top of that. In fact, at that moment, what's probably going to get you best results is a workout that takes a little bit of stress out of that bucket, right? Something that's helped more calm, more relaxing, maybe more mobility work, or you recognize my stress bucket's almost full. So my workouts are shorter, less intense and less frequent. Now, do you, uh, what are the things that you think insult that the most or like how, how do you either personally manage that or help like clients manage something like that? Because I guess that's so, um, it's very individual, right? It's very individual. Yeah. There's a, a wide range, you know, and maybe somebody who's always had like a rocky relationship. That's like life for them. It's yeah. like, I'm always fighting with my spouse. So mm. what am I going to do? Never work out hard. Like that's just normal for me. So like, how do you help somebody decide, am, am I already overfilling my bucket full of stress? Are there things that you're telling them to look out for or pay attention? Yeah. Well, you got to ask yourself, am I, uh, am I more stressed out now than I normally am? Because you're absolutely right. Like mm -hmm. someone might be able to cut me off in traffic or flip me off or whatever. And to me, it's like, you know, whatever. But to someone else, that may really cause a lot of stress and ruin their day. So this is a personal, this is a personal one for sure. Yeah, I think really it's just about like taking inventory. So if you can just sit there and think about all those things that even if you mention it, like, oh, like it, it tenses you up a bit and you realize that I'm carrying this with me. And this is, or it's something that you're constantly thinking about that you just can't stop spinning on. Uh, and you know, th these are things like, well, how can I, how can I actionably kind of take steps towards reducing that amount of stress? And maybe if it's work, it's, it's like, right for me, it's writing things down and getting more organized. So it's like, I can 
tick things off one by one. Yeah. And, and so then that kind of lowers taking all of it on at once in my mind. Uh, so that's one way I can kind of address that. And then also too, if I need to have a confrontation with a relationship, I need to, to face that. I need to go, you know, take action in that direction, but it, it's individual a hundred percent. Uh, you just have to kind of realize like what those steps look like. Cause I, I know a lot of people that, that use the workout as their way of, you know, de-stressing. Of course. Mm-hmm. They, you know, I got in a fight with my wife or I got this financial stress right now or I just got fired from my job. Oh my God, all this stuff. So I'm going to go to the wor- go to the gym and hammer the shit out of myself. Like mm-hmm. a lot of times that's where people go and thinking that that's going to be, and they get that temporary feeling as we talk about the, the cortisol junkies, right? They get that that spike in that and that feels good. Cortisol temporary. feels good. Right. It gives them that good feeling like, oh, I'm so glad I went and did that. But- in reality, they may not get the results that they want from that. Because if you're going to the gym to uh, make a body composition change, right, reduce body fat or build muscle, and you go there and that's your goal, but then you're going there because you got all this stress and then you do like an intense workout to give you that temporary spike Mm -hmm. that gives you a temporary feeling of relief. In reality, though, you weren't doing as much good for your body as you you thought you were doing. And so I, I, I think it's important that you, you're you paying attention to both. Like, say my client is recovering really well, and that is their answer. Okay, it's not that big of a deal. But if we're in a plateau, and we're not recovering really well, right. and then I know that they're doing all the stress, and I know that they're also punishing themselves in the gym, now I have something to like use as like, okay, well, if you were seeing good results, and you did that every, every once in a while, probably not big, a big deal. But if I've got you, and you're stuck in this hard plateau, you're complaining about being sore all the time, and then I also know that you're using your workout to try and you know not think about your wife that you hate or not think about your job that you hate yeah. and that's probably what level are you right now right right, right. i think so, that's a yeah, good way to kind of figure that out out to that right yeah, no that's a very good point all right this next one is um this one was relatively common with newer clients which is they weren't meeting their nutritional needs uh, in other words you need resources to repair heal and adapt that means that you know you could send all the your, your body could have all the plans for repair, all the plans for adaptation, but if it doesn't have the the building blocks, it's not going to do anything. So, can you negatively affect your recovery because your calories are too low? Yeah, in fact, that's one of the number one things to look out for when you're mm. on a diet where you're cutting your calories. Is am I recovering? I can't recover because my calories are so low. Not enough protein. That was a big one, especially with my with female clients where they just they weren't getting enough protein. You know, they were like, like 40 grams a day. It was really, really low. So I'd have them bump it to 80 grams or something like that, which still isn't super high, but it's twice as much as they were doing before. And all of a sudden, they're like, man, I could recover much better. I feel so much stronger. I remember a, a, a buddy of mine back when I used to train in jiu-jitsu, he would come in and he kept complaining about his joints and how sore he was getting. Mm-hmm. And so then I said, you know, do you mind if I ask you about your nutrition? Because, you know, I'm, I'm in the fitness space. And so we talked and he was a he was vegan. So I said, you know, sometimes it's hard to get enough protein when you're eating a vegan diet. Do you mind if I ask where you get your protein sources? And he wasn't supplementing with protein. I said, well, why don't you try a, a, a vegan protein powder and take it post-workout and just see how you feel? And I remember he came back and he was like, dude, it's like magic. He's like, I'm recovering so much better. You're, he just wasn't getting the the adequate amount of protein that his body mm. needed to recover from what he was doing. So I yeah. think this is actually why people a lot of times feel like protein powders are so magical. It's why the 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 space is is, yeah. is yeah. so the, big the and why efficiency is there a lot. Of yeah, times. because there's people that man, I tell you what, when I start taking my protein shake, I start seeing and they they attribute it to the protein shake, but in reality. It's, it's just because they were under consuming. Yeah, they protein. could eat a chicken breast. Or yeah, they like exactly. If they would have just went and had you know eight ounces more of chicken breast every single day instead of the shake, they would have felt the exact same results. And so I think it's important that you understand that because I agree. This is the this is the number one thing personally for myself. I've talked about on the show before that you know I just gravitate towards carbs or I could easily meal skip the size of my body. I need two hundred grams of protein, give or mm-hmm. take. Uh, it's really easy. I can go on a day and hit 90 grams of protein, mm-hmm. like and and do that chronically for a week, two weeks straight. And so this is actually the first place that I go. Is I'm pretty good at being aware of like my day to day stress. If I didn't get very good sleep, how to back off the workout. But if I notice I'm really sore and I'm not recovering very much, it's almost always I'm under consuming protein and I need to bump that. Well, I feel like too in my my own personal experience and also uh, training, coaching a lot of athletes, like they handle this piece 
piece of it like terribly uh, because of the fact that they're moving so often and, uh, you know, there's so much high demand physically all the time. And it's almost the sense that they could consume anything and it's not going to have that much effect on them uh, personally. But like having including a lot of inflammatory foods and, and you know, oh, yeah. a lot of processed type foods and, you know, um, simple carbohydrates and things that the, you know, their body might be reacting to, like putting them in a perpetual state of inflammation, uh, that's something you're going to keep fighting, uh, you know, throughout the next day. It's going to affect the way you sleep. It has this cascading effect. Dude, uh, I remember it. talking to, I think it was Rob Wolf. He's a good friend of ours. And he was, this is when the continual glucose monitors were, you know, becoming a thing. And he was explaining to me how he was observed, he observed in, in, in someone that they would get a stronger insulin response from an avocado than they did from a cookie. Yeah, yeah. And he was like, this is so strange. And then you realize, well, they they have an intolerance to the avocado. So when you have an intolerance to a food, which is an allergy, an allergy is much more extreme, but this person had an intolerance, their body looked at this avocado and mounted an immune response. What it did is it mobilized sugar out of the liver, spiking sugar in the blood, causing a rise in insulin. So this is a bit of a extreme example, but... If you're eating foods that your body is not digesting well, not processing well, that's a stress. It's yeah. another stress on your body. So rather than recovering really well, your body now is dealing with these foods that are causing bloat or constipation or diarrhea or acid reflux or inflammation. And so it's taking away from your body's ability to repair and recover. I 100%, this is me personally, I 100% recover better when I eat my carbohydrates from gluten-free containing foods, 100%. Mm -hmm. I can actually get away with eating gluten for a little while before it starts to show up in terms of my digestion. But the first thing I notice is I get sore more often. And it's because my body's just more inflamed because I have a mild intolerance to gluten. Now, this next one, um, I feel like, one, uh, it's getting worse. Two, uh, I think that if you've checked all the boxes, like you're listening right now and you're like, you know, I'm, I'm good. I do that. No, I do. I hit my protein thing and you're oh, I'm asleep and you're listening right now, but yet I'm still having a hard time. This is the next area. And I always, by the way, I like to check all these boxes first before I send somebody in this direction to possibly like, go get your blood work. Let's start to look at your hormones. Last night we had uh, Dr. Rand in our uh, Mind Pump Hormones um, uh, forum. And this was like a major conversation. And he says, you know, Sometimes like our, our test levels and our estrogen levels isn't enough to tell the whole story and that it's important that we're also finding out from the, the client their feedback. Like, hey, I'm sore all the time. My energy levels are down, but it says my test level is somewhat normal. It's like your hormones could be off and you still not be in a dangerous place. And if you've checked all these other boxes, you're doing all the other things we're talking about, this very well could yeah. be the reason why you're not recovering. Yeah, hormone mm -hmm. imbalance issues tend to feel like this. It tends to feel like out of, out of nowhere. Like, wait a minute, this, this is really weird. Nothing has really changed. All of a sudden, uh, I'm losing muscle. I'm gaining body fat very easily. My energy is kind of low. This is very, very strange. Like, what's going on? Like, I have a friend who um, got, got her thyroid uh, tested and found that she was creating too many antibodies. And, and she had all these strange unexplainable symptoms. And she's like, I'm doing all these things right. And I feel like I'm rested, I, but my body's just not responding. That's That can sometimes point to hormone imbalance issues. And so what you could do is you'll get tested. And you, by the way, you want to go to a hormone specialist because a hormone specialist, this is way more complex than looking at the range. This is what I've learned recently by mm -hmm. uh, through working with regenerative and sport medicine. That's the company that we have affiliated with that does this kind of stuff is that if you, it's not just about looking in the range because you can look at a range, just give an example of like testosterone range for men. It'll start at 300 nanograms per deciliter. I think is the, that's the way that they unit of measurement as high as a thousand, right? So you could be 305 and they'll, and you're within normal range, right? You could be 900 and be within normal range. Uh, so it's not. It's much more complex than that. It's looking at all the hormones and relationship to each other, and then of course the types of symptoms that you're exhibiting. So if you're like, man, I am so tired all the time, then they look at your testosterone. Like, well, you're 450, so you're low, but you're not at a range. How's your sleep? 
Like, oh, I sleep, you know, I got a newborn. I sleep three hours a night. Okay, let's look at that first. Let's work on your sleep first. Or if you're like, I, man, I get nine hours of sleep every single night. I wake up exhausted. I don't know what the heck is going on. Okay, it might be your testosterone. It might be that's what's going on, and they'll look a little deeper. So if this is a, if this is something you want to look into, this is not our expertise. We're fitness experts, not hormone experts. Um, then I recommend you go to, I think it is it mphormones.com or mind, MP? MP so hormones. Letter mphormones.com, and then you can ask more questions about this. All right, so this last one is last for a reason, and that's because of all the things that we talked about, this contributes the least to your body's ability to recover. That doesn't mean it doesn't have a role and it can't help, but it won't fix your recovery issues if your recovery issues are because of all the things that we talked about, okay? So this can give you a little bit of an edge, and that's about it. And I think that that the, the next thing that we're talking about, which is supplements, it's cool to use when you're doing everything right and you're pushing your body and you're kind of you know up against that line, right? You keep mm -hmm. pushing up against the line, so you want a little bit more of a buffer so you can continue to train really intensely. And there are certain supplements that have been proven to enhance recovery. Again, it's not going to fix poor sleep. It's not going to fix poor programming or a crappy diet. But if all those things are good and you want to push your body a little harder, but you're kind of on that line, then they can kind of help. And the first supplement is creatine. Creatine's easily the most studied ergogenic supplement around. There's thousands of studies, many of them peer-reviewed, double-blind, placebo-controlled. It's safe. It's effective. It's actually healthy. They're now recommending it to older populations. It's good for the brain and the heart, not just your muscles. It does make you stronger, and it does help your mitochondria function better gives them more energy so that you can speed up the recovery process. Now, I want to go back to the creatine one because originally creatine was really promoted as like a energy and building muscle. Has it more recently been, uh, you know, attached to recovery and speeding up that process? Because I that wasn't always like that, right? No, but that's part of the reason why it helps you build muscle. So it, it amps up muscle protein synthesis, right? So that's where your body takes the protein and turns it into active tissue or utilizes it for, let's say, building muscle, which is the thing that we're trying to do, or repair muscle. Creatine supplementation increases ATP in the body. ATP is the, one of the primary sources of energy for most all of your cells, or if not all of the cells. And when you have more ATP, that protein synthesis cycle speeds up a little bit. So you get a little bit of a faster recovery process. So that's what it is. Process. because of the, the recovery process of the ATP and ADP yeah. is that it's contributing to the process of recovering. Because it's got more of that energy, it could then recover yes. at a faster rate. Yes. It also increases intracellular fluid. So uh, what you'll notice when you take creatine is you may gain initially a couple pounds on the scale and people are like, oh, it's water weight. It, it is. It's not bloat, by the way. Bloat is outside of the cells. Inside the cells, uh, fluid looks good. It's like a pump is kind of like that, right? So muscles look a little fuller, a little tighter, but increasing intracellular fluid improves nutrient de delivery, improves waste removal, reduces inflammation. So that also helps speed up the, the process uh, of recovery. Another one is ashwagandha. This yeah. is very heavily studied herb. It's been in, uh, in used by for thousands of years in Ayurvedic medicine. Um, and it ashwagandha- seems new, this whole class of supplements, yes. the adaptogens, like it's interesting to see how they can kind of balance everything out. Yeah, for and Western medicine, right? But Eastern medicine has been using this yeah, stuff forever, it's right? It's been around for, for a long, long time. time. And ashwagandha around. is a stress recovery uh, supplement. And it's the first, one of the first uh, supplements that'll get recommended to you by an Ayurvedic practitioner would you, if you're would, under a lot of stress. Would you classify it as like the, the king of adaptogens? Would you? Would, Ooh, would you what, that's would, probably ginseng. I didn't put ginseng up here though because people can react very strangely to ginseng. I'm one of those. Mm. Like if I take ginseng, it makes me like really hot and feverish and not feel so good. Ashwagandha, um, I have yet... I think if you have a really bad intolerance or an allergy to nightshades, maybe don't do ashwagandha. But I have yet to run into a client or somebody I recommended to who who didn't feel some kind of a positive uh, mm. effect from ashwagandha. It's like better sleep and it helps your body utilize cortisol a little bit better. Um, so you get more energy. It's really, really good. Rodeo, rhodiola is another one. Rhodiola is more of a stimulant. Uh, it's actually a good replacement for caffeine for some people. That's been shown to speed up recovery. 
protein powder if your protein's low that's a big one man if you we just talked about that earlier. Well, that's probably the to me yeah, that's the that's first the one like yeah. even though it falls in the supplement category and in the real truth is it it's not the protein powder. It's that you're low on your protein. That's just a quick and easy way to do it. Yep. So if you're somebody who uh, chronically misses your protein intake, then simply taking a shake every single day could be game changing for you. Yeah. Mushroom supplements are big now too, although yeah. they've been used forever. Like Cordyceps is one of my favorites. That mm -hmm. one, you know, that one got um, a lot of news. I think it was the, I want to say the, uh, the 2000 the Chinese Olympics. Chinese Olympic team. Yeah. The, the swimmers were swimmers, crushing yeah. and, they said, oh, it's cordyceps. Who knows if it was cordyceps? Maybe it was uh, some, <laughs> some exotic anabolic steroids. <laughs> but uh, people started diving in the research. Yeah. And cordyceps does improve recovery, and it improves VO2 max and stamina in particular. So for people who want more stamina, work capacity, I've recommended cordyceps to people who have DM me who do like physical labor jobs. So I'll say, try cordyceps. And they notice that they are, you know, better heat tolerance and they can work longer. So that's kind of a cool supplement. Rishi, uh, which I hope I'm pronouncing it right, it's R-E-I-S-H-I. This is another, you know, kind of adaptogenic type uh, supplement. Um, but here now, here's the problem with some of these herbs and stuff is that you got to find good sources. Yeah. Um, uh, Four Sigmatics, the company we work with, with the mushroom-based ones, they're the best by far. I, I haven't yet to find... Uh, mushroom-based supplement company that comes close to the the stringent you know quality control that they have with, with their products, and then there's this last one that it, I love because I brought this up I think the first time on the podcast like seven years ago six years ago. Mm. Now it's exploding all over the place. Oh, yeah. So I do want to give do a little a little clarity around the supplement. Okay, so this particular supplement is called ectisterone, and there are uh, other types of sterones that are similar, like turkesterone very similar to ectosterone. These are insect hormones. That's making or, its round right now too, by yes, the way. Yeah, yeah. I've seen that all over the place. Both of them, right? So they're insect hormones. Literally, it's a hormone in insects that gets them to molt, but it's also something you find in plants. And it has this very interesting effect in humans where it gets you to build more muscle and recover faster and it gets you leaner. And yes, it does work. It's been studied and it does work. You got to find really good stuff. The problem is this. You grow the, an ectoskeleton. Yeah. You, <laughs> that's the problem. You start you to grow other legs. Like a bug. <laughs> no, you, it actually stops working. After about 45 days, you notice that you don't get this effect anymore. It's a very short-lived oh. kind of product, and uh, but it, you definitely notice it when you're on it. We, sorry, we have no affiliate. We have no companies that uh, we can promote. And, and I'll say probably a good 50% of the stuff out in the market is garbage. So it's really poor uh, quality control. Again, it's not going to fix poor sleep, bad diet, bad programming, none of that stuff. But if everything's good, this is one of the supplements that you may notice when you take it. Now, that being said, I do want to uh, express that they're not quite sure how it works. They think it's mediated through the estrogen receptor, believe it or not, which makes me want to avoid recommending it to women. And mm -hmm. all the studies I've seen have been done on men. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't recommend it to women because I don't know what the potential effects can be with women. Uh, but with men, it seems to be all good. <laughs> So there you have it. Uh, all the stuff you can do or the reasons why you're not recovering and some of the stuff you can do to speed up that process. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free guides on fitness and fat loss, nutrition, and guides on personal training. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpsal. And Adam is at mindpumpadam. 